My name is Stephen Helms, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher. So that's what you are after you finish your PhD at the FOM Institute of Malf here in Amsterdam. I am studying biophysics, and I'm trying to understand how behavior works in a model organism. The worm community started in the mid 70s with. Well, there was previous research on this organism, but as a model for understanding the nervous system, it was really started by uh, the Nobel Prize winner, Sidney Brenner, in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And so he picked this as a good model for, for understanding how a brain works. And the community is still relatively small. So for example, this year I went to the international worm meeting where most of the researchers go, and it had, I think it was three or 5,000 people. So it's big, but at the same time, Everyone knows each other and they all work together and try to make it easy to, to pool information to understand how the simple organism works. Yeah. But yeah, other fields, sometimes people can be very competitive or yeah, they don't easily or share not things. Share, but, not yeah, share, yeah. Not sharing wise, but this is the. But this is like a, like a sort of like the open source community and like programming, this is yeah. sort of the equivalent in biology. In general, in biology, there's this problem that there's a lot of molecules and genes and cells involved in everything you look at. And behavior is particularly the worst case because that's the output of what an entire organism does. So you have each cell, which has thousands of parts and things happening inside of it. And you have many cells working together. And you have neurons that cooperate together to make a brain, to make you know, decisions and, and process information on the outside. And so it is definitely a difficult problem because you have to deal with all these different parts working together and figure out how, in the end, that makes something happen. There are certain model organisms we use in biology. So the worm is one. The next more complex organism it would be a fruit fly, which that has orders of magnitude more neurons. And then if we move to you know our brains, it's even you know far far more. Yeah. So, but at the same time, many of the core features of what brains do, you can see in the worm's behavior. But because there's only 302 neurons, we have a hope of actually being able to understand it. And then there's also, there are many great experimental tools we can use. So we, we know all the cells of the worm, and they all have names. So I can go to a website, and I can look up what a cell does and where it is. So there's this great website called Worm Atlas that has information on the anatomy of the worm. So I can do things like pull up this AVA neuron. And so there's a left and right one. And you can see a picture of where the neuron is in the head of the worm. Yeah. And they have a list that says, you know, what, what uh, molecules it uses to communicate with other neurons, and what, uh, what sensors it has, and then the known functions of it. Mm -hmm. So this neuron, for example, is, one of, is an interneuron. So it's a neuron that gathers information from other neurons and makes decisions, and it's involved in controlling the, the motion of the worm. So we have all these great re resources like this, and we can also experimentally manipulate the worm. So if I want, I can go in and I can use a laser to kill this particular neuron and see what happens to the, to the worm. So that's how they do things like this and figure out that it's involved in, in this case, making the worm go in reverse. So there's a picture here from my experimental setup of a plate, and there are four worms placed within these uh, 10 by 10 millimeter boxes. Yeah. And then I track them for 30 minutes, so I just record a video, and then using a computer algorithm, I automatically find and, and characterize where the worm is. So I can measure things like the shape of its body, where its head is, and where, where it's located. And if you follow that for 30 minutes, you get something that looks like this. So these are two different species of worms. Mm -hmm. And the, the box here corresponds to this uh, 10 by 10 millimeter grid. So you can see like, on the left is a worm where it explored most of the space available to yeah. it. And on the right is a case where the worm stayed within a very small spot. Yeah. I take this data. So this is just one snapshot at the end of the experiment showing you where it went. But I have data for the movement of the worm over this entire period. And you get a lot of data points that characterize its movement. And it's a great system because you can get a lot of quantitative information out of that. So I'm building models that capture all the intricate features of what the worm is doing, and then trying to use this characterization to describe the behavior. Um, as I was mentioning, th there's a lot of data here. And the key to this model building approach is to really, yeah, amass as much data as possible because I really want to take the raw data and use that to directly build models. So right now I'm kind of operating on the limits of what I can do computationally. 
So I've worked out experiments where everything is automated up until the point where I'm actually, you know, thinking about the data myself. That I can't automate. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so the amount of data I can can process right now is being limited by the fact that, for example, my desktop computer it takes three times as long to process the data as it takes to collect an experiment. So I can keep doing lots of experiments, but I end up with this huge backlog of data to process. And then the storage is also a problem. So again, I track these things by using video microscopy. And these videos are, are huge. So it's a, the raw video file is 240 gigabytes per hour. Okay. And you know there are many, many experiments. Yeah. So storage becomes a, an issue as well. I can already start to see interesting things with the data I have, but I really would like to have about at least 10 times more data than I have. And to do that, I would really start having troubles with the amount of power and storage I have available to me. So right now I'm already using up basically half of my, my lab's storage space for my one experiment I've done so really? far. <laughs> yeah. So how do your colleagues uh, look, uh, look at yeah. you? Yeah, well, my, my colleagues are also generating lots of data, but they, the, the computing support people at the university, they, they're not so happy. <laughs> they keep thinking, why do you need all this data? <laughs> Before I went into science, I was also thinking about going into computing because I always thought computers were fascinating. And then I later figured out that Biology is an even better computer than the computers we build. <laughs> so I think for me it's fun keeping up with the new technology, but it also is something, yeah, it's, it's important to, to constantly pay attention to the new things you can do because it's opening up a lot of new possibilities now because we can collect so much more data. We can analyze it in ways we couldn't do years ago because we didn't have the computational power to do it at a you know, reasonable time scale. Yeah. So it's... Yeah, it's exciting that we have all these new opportunities, but it definitely requires that you keep up to date and talk to people who know how to do these things. So I, I've been learning a lot from people from uh, Surfstar, for example, about you know, new computing technologies that I sort of had vaguely heard about but hadn't previously read any information on yeah. and how they can help me in my research. I would just be happy if I could say, if I see some changes in behavior and I can say how the changes in some neurons I can look at in the worm, if I can explain everything about how the worm's behavior changed by, by explaining the activity of these neurons. And I think that's something that's achievable over like a 10 year time scale. Yeah. But then the problem is gonna be scaling it up to more complex organisms. Yeah. But if we can't do it for a worm, it's gonna be very hard to do for a human. And I think it's again this problem that we don't have a good understanding of what is actually going on inside of organisms. And this is particularly the case for our brain. So I'm hoping that by developing tools here for theoretically understanding how the nervous system works, mm -hmm. then when we look at more complicated things, we have at least some hope of, of rationally understanding what is going on. Yeah. Again, right now, it's not, not so much a rational process. I mean, there's, some, there's an effort to do this. I shouldn't uh, dismiss what people are trying to do, but yeah. it's been a huge problem. I think it's a good day when I find some simple explanation for something complicated that happened. Yeah. So sometimes it's like, yeah, you have data that looks really weird and complicated, but if I can find some simple theory or I can look at it in some nice way, then I feel content. I, I, I'm really trying to find, I, I believe fundamentally that, that biology is not complex, that there is some simple rules underlying it, and I'm trying to figure out what those rules are. So any day that I find some simpler way of describing something that I've been looking at, I'm, I'm happy.